nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So thank you very much for having me. So I'm going to talk uh, mostly about NEMO 5 work on modeling and things that might be of more immediate interest to you. But since I'm the director of NanoHub, I, I can't uh, start a talk without showing a cool graph like that. Uh, it's uh, people uh, signing up, registering. The bigger the symbol, the more people from a particular time and place. They turn into simulation users. There's about 13,000 simulation users each year now running simulations like an app in your phone, except it's a real powerful scientific application. And then uh, we started a decoy of hosting lectures, and they totally took over by a factor of 100 people looking at lectures on nanotechnology. And basically, NanoHub doesn't sleep. It seems like maybe at 3 AM, it kind of gets a little tiresome. But uh, it's basically a, tw a facility open 24-7. And this is an integrated view of uh, NanoHub users within one year. So apparently, nanotechnology electronics really is uh, creating an interest all over the world on, on uh, learning how to understand this material. So that being said, I'm going to dive into a couple of aspects of nanoelectronics. I'm sure you've seen this chart, Intel roadmap, and uh, it's always good to actually show an older roadmap so you can actually look back in history how good or how bad they were. And I'm going to focus in on one aspect here, the 22 nanometer FinFET. So here's an example from their roadmap, and that is what a standard CAD tool would maybe plot today. And uh, if you look at it more carefully with an SEM taken from images from here, uh, look at the fin, so really this blue interface here, you can measure this to be about 8 nanometers thin. Even though it's a 22 nanometer gate length, normally the fin is 8 nanometers thin. So let's translate that. That's about 64 atoms. That's pretty small. That's very countable. And if you mesh this out in a Nemo-like tool, you have about 1,000 atoms in the cross-section. Also still countable, not a gazillion plus 1 or 10 to the 23, right? Certainly not bulk. So uh, going back to this uh, roadmap now, if we look down the line to these nodes that are sort of technology nodes and just translate in silicon the number of atoms that make up the gate length, we're going down to, so 40. 40 atoms long of a gate. Now, if I look at the number that I just showed you, the critical atoms, where we don't know quite what's coming down the pike, 64 atoms today, 14 atoms down the pike, if you believe in this kind of roadmap. Very, very countable. The issue with that is that you can't buy a tool that actually designs devices at the atom atomic level. Any TCAD tool, you can pay $100,000 per seat, synopsis, and it does not even know atoms exist. It's a solid model, like what I showed earlier. It's just a continuum model, like what mechanical engineers would do, and that's perfectly fine for large devices. So that's why I've been working on this atomistic modeling for a while. And uh, if there's another aspect in this that's often neglected. If you actually look at the number of electrons on a gate, it's going down to teens. So single electronics is actually not that far away, if you think. But it's very far away from modeling and understanding uh, these devices. So I spend a lot of time in my career working on some of these issues. And here's one that I like a lot. It's uh, a physicist. They're allowed to cool devices down. They took a FinFET from 2008, cooled it down, and found single electron effects in single impurities. And with a million atom simulations that I'll show later, we could fingerprint those as being arsenic versus phosphor, just by the impurity states, the excited states. So you can do that. So just that's sort of an enticement. Um, maybe some of you have seen the work from Michelle Simmons, where you can build uh, metal patches, quasi-metal patches that are one atom tall and a um, couple of atoms wide. And then you have wires that are at the ultimate limit, maybe one, two dimers wide, so four atoms wide. That's the ultimate limit of scaling, right? You're not going to make wires a whole lot smaller than four atoms wide, right? And then you can maybe put single phosphor impurities in there, and then you can have fancy publications of a single atom transistor that, of course, will never, ever operate at room temperature. 
but that's the nature of these journals, right? There's a lot of interesting things you can highlight, but uh, to me, a lot of this work is actually calibration work. Can the modeling that I do understand single impurities? Can it model the excited states in such systems? And how does that then translate into realistic systems? So uh, that's the physical limit of Moore's law, but there's already uh, a much more relevant limit, which is uh, the true Moore's law, which is an economic law. Moore actually sketched down originally an economic law of number of transistors versus uh, cost to produce them. And for many years, the price uh, or the number of transistors you can buy per dollar has increased, but now it's actually decreasing. So there's almost hardly any commercial viability in scaling down anymore, at least not the, the transistor per dollar metric. So uh, really, in, it's in a sense, the economic end of Moore's law has hit us today already. So with that being said, I want to highlight where we live in this world. So I love this chart. It's really old, 2004 from in Robert Chow. But the cool thing is they did come out in 2012 with a 22 nanometer note, right? I mean, they projected literally eight, 10 years down the line on what they're going to come out with. And uh, the future is a little bit more uncertain, but what you can see is there's 3D spatial variations on the nanometer scale. These are not bulk materials. These are not bulk light FETs. There's potential variations on the nanometer scale. There's huge voltages, fields that you drop over these devices. And there's new channel materials that are considered. Obviously, strain is important. Quantization is important. One major NEMO result that Chris Bowen derived is actually the rotated substrate. Rotating substrate by 45 degree gives you a PFET that is actually much better than the unrotated one, and that's how TI caught up with Intel without doing silicon germanium and all that. So that was a cool NEMO result. So crystal orientation has become important. I mentioned atoms are countable, and really my take is, is this a new material or a new device? I think you have to consider both in the context of each other. You can't just say it's a new device or it's a new material. And what I'd like to assert today and give you some examples that you run this at high buys out of equilibrium, you need to do quantum mechanics and, as I mentioned, atomistic representations. And I'll show you some of the aspects of that in a while. All right, so here's the outline of my presentation. I want to um, highlight some of the band structure concepts, some really old RTD, resonant tunneling diode results. Not to bore you, but to give you an idea on very simple results that then can be translated into today's stuff. And one thing that is very often neglected or not treated at all is really how do you treat the contacts and the reservoirs that feed into the central device. And then I'll talk a little bit about steep subthreshold devices, uh, a little bit about quantum dots. And here's a segment I haven't talked in public about gallium nitride LED modeling. Um, something that is just happening in my group. It's, I think, pretty exciting, pretty cool. And then I'll show you what's sort of under the hood and give you some details on what the models are. So if you have questions about what are the, how do you do all this, hold your questions maybe to the end. And then I'll talk a little bit about NanoHub. So I'm going to go to the very basics, right? How did quantum mechanics get discovered? by really optical measurements in gaseous systems, right? People identified various spectra and understood, began to understand quantum mechanics. And now as uh, electrical engineers or device physicists, we put these atoms together and these isolated states become what we call bands. And we have transport, etc. And supposedly in these bands, electrons move freely. The question is, what do you mean by freely? If you look at a crystal like this, here's a tiny quantum dot, you rotate it around, you can already see just upon a, a, a 45 degree rotation, you see that the, the quantum dot looks very different in different crystal directions, right? So why do you assume electrons will flow or be not handicapped in one way or another by the underlying crystal? And the uh, basis functions we use, like S and P and D orbitals, are anything but spherically symmetric. They eventually sum up to something that's spherically symmetric as a basis, but not necessarily get picked that way. And if you, uh, I'm sure with Chris Van Navala, you're teaching it very, very much better than me, than what I learned in 
when I went to school, uh, we basically got thrown a Schrodinger equation at us. We said there's an ansatz of plane waves, and some god gives you a spaghetti-like curve that is a dispersion relationship. This is how electrons move in a crystal, but don't worry about it, even though they might be coupled. All we're doing is really we're assuming that there's some parabolas. And then we forget all the quantum mechanics again. That was roughly how I was introduced to band structure, more or less. And uh, what happens then is people build all kinds of sophisticated models. They build uh, drift diffusion simulators, Boltzmann transport simulators, or even most quantum transport simulators are based on the assumption that you have some parabolic bands and that is what you live with. The existence of atoms is completely denied in this. And the coupling of the bands is completely denied. And that's what I'm going to try to show you, that when they're coupled and they're non-parabolic, all kinds of interesting things happen. So here, most of you are too young to know what a resonant tunneling diode is, right? It's a double barrier structure. There's maybe one or two states in it. You apply a voltage. Then you, the sea of electrons can flow through the first state. Current goes up. As you apply a higher voltage, current goes down because there's no supply of electrons in the band gap and then eventually conduct either through the second state or thermionically. Right? That's a nice Mickey Mouse diagram of an RTD. Now, a realistic device might look like something like this. The green dots are actually experimental data taken after the prediction with a black line. And in order to get there, so predict experiment, we had to do all kinds of things. And I'm going to try to highlight some of those items that helped us get there. And then I want to highlight why we need to continue things like that. So the key element was we had to put the atoms back into the thinking. It is no longer just a continuum. We had to put the atoms in. Which uh, we do this in the tight binding basis, uh, where we uh, assume basis states. And really, that kind of means you have a multiband basis set. And this is a material where this is 5 nanometers, 5 nanometers, 5 nanometers. The central device is roughly 15 nanometers big. That is not a material that shows up in nature, right? Its electronic structure is actually special to that geometry. And you need to consider that. And that's really a materials aspect. So what are some of the things that can happen? I'll try to walk you through some of the physical effects. So here's your man-made resonator double barrier structure, resonance uh, length L. If you look at a parabolic dispersion, E versus K, you can say, well, my ground state should be at pi over L, half a wavelength. I'm going to go into my dispersion, say here's my K0, and I can sort of say, here's my ground state. Obviously, my computer will not do it like that, but this serves me well right now. If I say, where's my excited state, it would be at 2 pi over L, two wavelengths in there. So I double my k, and I find an eigenstate that would be up here. Now, what happens if you have a non-parabolic material, like any of the advanced in-gas type materials that we were interested in, is the following. The ground state might still roughly be about the same. But if I look at the excited state, it's actually significantly lower than the single band effective mass model. And it can be as low as 100 millectron volt lower. That's 4 kT lower. And that's a significant energy difference. And you see that in the experiments. So most people in the early 90s were maybe beginning to measure RTDs. And here you have uh, a, a blue and a green line. That's experimental data. And if you had a single band effective mass code, like what everybody else had in the, in the universe, they would get sort of a peak roughly right and then a valley current that was completely wrong. No valley current whatsoever, and the assumption was, well, it must be scattering. But it's not scattering in this sense. It, what it is, is it's really thermionic emission through a state that is much, much lower. Very simple physics. And it's off by three orders of magnitude. That's how bad the assumption of an effective mass model in this sense is. No, no sophisticated physics set. But now you say, well, Clemek, what's up with this, right? You're still, your peak current, you said the peaks are the same, right? The ground state is roughly the same. Why is the current different? They should be the same. And there's a second effect that is very important. And that is the following. Now let's assume we are uh, sending an electron into a barrier material. 
We all have taken a simple quantum mechanics class where there's a propagating state above the barrier and there's an attenuated state below the barrier. We can calculate an attenuation constant, right? And if we send an electron in at a certain energy, we can calculate the attenuation constant of that, right? Analytically, everybody can do it. Now, in reality, you have a conduction and a valence band, and they actually talk to each other. So in the complex plane, there's actually a wrapping. And if you send in an electron at the same energy, the constant kappa is much smaller in the exponent of your attenuation. Therefore, this barrier is actually much more transparent than you think it is. So let me repeat that. Barriers in general are more transparent than they thi you think they are if you're injecting anywhere close uh, to uh, uh, the band edges of relevance. Okay? And then you, that's why the current is actually rising up further. So those are two simple effects. There's a couple of other things that can be done right. Here's a transmission coefficient through such a double barrier structure. If it's a simple gallium arsenide-like thing that transfers momentum or the transverse dispersion when the electrons go just straight through but at an angle is kind of parabolic and then the dispersion at a particular k is also kind of looking the same as this. Right? So no big relations there. But if you look for example at holes where there's uh, light holes that are, have a broad resonance and heavy holes that have a very narrow resonance, the dispersion is really looking crazy. Because you have multiple bands interacting with each other, where you have a crossing and anti-crossing. And by the way, silicon is in many ways the same. There's a light electron and a heavy electron. It just happens to be in the conduction band, right? So all kinds of crazy stuff can happen and does happen at the nanoscale. And the transmission coefficient in this ki ki case here with k equals zero to the k equal in the middle point here, they have nothing to do with each other. So the point is, the electrons behave very differently as they go at an angle through a structure than straight through, and it matters. Okay? You can't just assume everybody's going straight, and that's the major assumption. All of that flew into the IV I just showed, and tight binding handles all of these multiple bands, and if you squeeze the atoms together, it handles the strain and non parabolicity automatically. And um, these RTDs are, in a sense, very similar to ultra-thin bodies, because all you have to do is turn it around, and it looks very similar to this fin fat. Right? So all of the important physics we learned some 20 years ago are now very applicable to these fin fats. Okay? Um, and then we ran IV characteristics and uh, different uh, stacks. Alan Seaborn and Ted Moise at TI built stacks and stacks of RTDs, and we could really benchmark our tool, and we were overlaying experiments quite nicely. So, so far, I've shown you things that might be sort of intuitive, and yes, you could have done that with an effective mass model. If you just tweak the effective mass model just right, I can match any IV I want. The point is, can you be predictive, right? Can you do a whole stack of different devices and not tweak a single parameter? just the geometry, right? And that is the strength to be predictive. And there's one missing item that I haven't highlighted, which is the treatment of complex contacts. And I want to walk you through that, because that's a key message of what I like to convey today for the devices we worry about today. But it's very ex easily explained in, in these simple devices. So here's an optical switch device that uh, Ted Moise and Bobby Brower worked on at TI. There's an optical window here, and here's a central RTD. It was an optical trigger with a light pulse. You would turn on and off the current. But it looks like a nightmarish device, right? It's a multiple heterostructures in this device. Uh, the central RTD is small compared to the whole length of the device. And um, if you zoom in a little bit here closer to the contact, you see really a complicated quantum well in front of the RTD. And again, the central device is tiny. And then in the central device, you see the ground state and excited states. But you see all kinds of complex structure ahead of the device, in the contact, so to speak. And what we do is we found a way to partition the device, where we call this a reservoir on the left, or a contact on the left, and this is a contact on the right. And we treat that in quasi-equilibrium, 
here in more detail. And if we do that, uh, well, let me go back. The, so we treat that explicitly numerically, and this is not a perturbation in a sense. It is a numerical treatment of treating this point here that inject carriers into the device explicitly knowing all the details here. So it's not an approximation. The only approximation that flows in there is how are the states occupied. But the quantum mechanics of the states themselves are not approximated. And if we do that, we actually get uh, something that is extremely close to experiment. Here's an IV curve with a bunch of little wiggles that are all induced due to the details of the contact, and we get very similar wiggles. It's like fingerprinting what we have in the emitter. So the central device here is almost like a bandpass filter that probes what's happening in the emitter. And what you probe in the emitter are these different steps. And you basically pull your resonance like a bandpass filter through these resonances, and that's what turns on the current. So, the cur so really the emitter becomes of critical importance on how to treat this device. The emitter determines how electrons are being injected into the central device, and that's a theme that's going to repeat. Um, from a computational point of view, it's very advantageous. If you want to do something sophisticated on the central device, like phonon scattering or maybe optical interactions, you want to reduce that domain to be as small as needed so you can actually treat the large device in its context, but you only do the complicated physics where you need it. And that'll be revisited here with the super lattice FETs that we're working on with Mark Rodwell. Uh, it's on the gallium nitride TFETs that we work on with the LEAST team at Notre Dame. And that's the more exciting thing I wanted to share with you, these uh, gallium nitride-based LED devices where we use the same modeling principles. So, so we'll revisit that. Why do I think uh, this works really well for RTDs. Here's an example, the first time we really used it. You, we, at that time, people literally had scans of an uh, oscilloscope in papers, right? Nice, that's an anecdotal remark, right? Nothing digital in that sense. And they had their um, cooking recipe, like thickness of layers, listed like that. And it looks pretty harmless when you have a Mickey Mouse representation of it. But if you put this into context with a real potential profile under bias, you see that the central RTD is the smallest piece in 500 nanometers of material. Heavily doped contacts here and here, the yellow bar here is really the Fermi level plus minus 5 kT. You wonder, how do electrons possibly make it over there? And how do you treat that? How do you treat a device like that? And then you look at this IV very carefully, there's a little wiggle in there. And you ask yourself, what is that? So if you zoom into the central device here, you actually see again, double barrier structure, ground state, excited state, and a, tri a triangular quantum well in front with a ground state and excited states. And again, your central state is the sort of the bandpass filter that probes what's in the emitter. And indeed, you get conduction through that. Uh, but now I want to highlight, uh, so let me go make that point more explicit, right? So indeed, the main peak actually goes through the ground state, and the, the first wiggle is due to the excited state in the emitter. So different channels, different biases. All right, so what was the state of the art before we did that? What people did do is say, I know how to extend my device at infinitum if I have a flat band condition. Okay, I can calculate an injecting wave function into a scattering matrix or a Wigner function or whatever they were doing. So they basically attach flat band here and here. Or they can say, well, that has problems. Let me attach arbitrarily a flat band here and here. They just attach it, because that was the only thing that was available. Right? Numerically, you have to terminate your device. Somehow you got to get electrons in with some boundary condition. So if you do that, if you're attaching flat bands here in blue, here and here, obviously the carriers can't make it through that double, that huge bump, right? So the IV turns off as soon as the band pass touches, uh, goes below that big hump. So it turns off at some voltage. If you attach the green ones, 
uh, you have really no control on what's happening here in the triangular well, or you don't even know what this hump is, and you turn off in some other voltage. And it's completely arbitrary, right? Like you can attach it almost anywhere. And the true result that compares well to experiment is sort of in between, with multiple details and all that. So the point is, with this new reservoir treatment, we are able to treat an extended contact well and the intuition here is also there's a lot of electrons there. There's a lot of scattering going on, a lot of thermalization. I don't have to ex explicitly con calculate, but it's given in the method. And I only treat non-equilibrium in the central device domain, which is tiny compared to the large device. All right, so here's again this, some details on uh, self-consistently and band structure. But the essence is, this is, these are the key elements that got us to modeling these devices explicitly. Contact, self-consistency, band structure, put it all together, extend the device. That is what it took to get something like this. So I hope I motivated that band structure is important and contacts are important. Now I'm going to dive into a little bit of these gallium nitride devices and these super lattice FETs. So why are we working on tunneling FETs? Uh, I'm sure you've seen similar charts, right? The best transistor MOSFET you can build looks like this. You have 60 millivolt per decade slope here on the switch. You'd like to reduce the voltage, uh, the operating voltage, but if you do that, your, your uh, off current goes up exponentially. So your, your device in your pocket turns into a space heater, right? It becomes hot and consumes a lot of energy. What you really want is keep the off current the same and bend these curves over rather than shifting them over. But you can't do that with a MOSFET. The MOSFET, the best MOSFET you can build are this shape. And that has to do with the thermal distribution of carriers sort of above this hump of a transistor, right? This is the, the on-off element here that gates the current flow through this device. So tunneling FETs might give you that where you cut off the thermal tail of carriers and you tunnel through a window so there is no thermal excitation here and no thermal excitation here so therefore you have cold carriers so to speak and that gives you the hope that you can turn off this bandpass filter so to speak much better. Okay? So that's the potential that's being seen in these uh, gallium nitride uh, TFETs. We worked with um, Patrick Fay and did some uh, NEMO calculations and some drift diffusion calculations, they compared reasonably well, but I always felt they're not right. And I'm going to walk you through why I feel they were not right. So what you have here is a, a structure that is like this, and this is a, a test structure, a PN diode. And I'm going to home in on the central PN diode. So going back here, I'm going to home in onto this region here where you have the heterostructure, and I'm plotting the density of states. So you have a triangular well, similar to what I had shown before, with uh, various states, and again here it's blown up. And then you have the valence band here. These states in the conduction band will serve as the injector or receptor of electrons. And if you don't know how to occupy those, no current will flow through them. And really the intuitive physics here is that you have a say a source and a drain, and you have a barrier in between. So all of the electrons are going to be in a local equilibrium roughly with a right contact, and these holes are going to be in an equilibrium with a left contact, because they're separated by a big barrier. And there's lots of them, lots of scattering. There is no good theory in non-equilibrium green functions that actually calculates electron-electron scattering well. I can calculate until the cows come home. I won't get it right, because it's there is no so, uh, known solution for it that is physically accurate. So what we do instead is we assume a local equilibrium. We assume that there is very strong scattering that establishes equilibrium. So we put the scattering in, so to speak. Therefore, we don't have to compute it. What we do compute is the tunneling in between these layers. Again, that's, that's reservoir model. And the early implementation we had was this. Uh, we didn't have really a separation in energy and case space and local space. We could just do a dividing line like this and, and vary the dividing line. Uh, 
and we could see that the beautiful predictions that we had for the TFED really go to hell when we uh, in turn on scattering in there. But we knew we, we weren't doing it right yet. Right? But at least in this trivial, simple model, it was clear something bad is going to happen. So what we did do is look at this uh, IV, uh, the IV of a PN diode again. And if I do a coherent calculation, like the, what we did for the uh, transistors before, indeed, I cannot fill these states. And I can't fill them because they're separated by a huge long barrier back there. Okay? I can't get in. And if I calculate an IV, the experiment looks like this, and the ballistic one turns on in the wrong voltage. I have to apply a very much higher voltage, just like with this RTD I showed you before. But if I, so here's this big hump, right? I can't get through this hump, so my voltage I need to turn on is very different from the physical voltage that, I, that is being measured. So it's similar to that. So if I actually consider these states that should be occupied and actually do occupy them with this method, then I have transmission into these states and indeed my IV overlaps experiment. I get the right voltage, I get the right current density without adjusting any parameters. It's just treating the contact correctly. And not just with one device, but with two devices, we basically overlap experiment over orders of magnitude. Now you can argue about defects and all that. This is pretty simple calculation, but at least it gets us the right order of magnitude without trying too hard, by sticking in the right contact physics. All right, so it's a repeat. And then we do the same thing now with TFET, and indeed, uh, you need to really engineer this notch much better if you want to have a steep subthreshold swing, meaning the scattering in these notches is going to be important, which is sort of intuitively correct. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about super lattice FETs that's alongside these steep, steep subthreshold devices. So here is again a slide you've seen. Um, basically, you need to find a way to eliminate the thermal tail of electrons that are above this barrier. So the idea really is, can you insert a mini band that introduces a mini gap, and therefore there is no carriers up there? So, so there's a thermal distribution, but if the density of states is zero, then there's still no carriers. So here's the idea. In the on state, you have a mini, uh, uh, in the off state, you have a mini gap that blocks the current, and in the on state, you have a mini band that allows the current to flow. So this is um, on uh, Mark Rodswell's idea and work, and he, he wants to build it, and I'm like, good luck, right? It's a pretty, pretty tough thing to build. Uh, then the question for us now is, that is all fine, right? You have, we're assuming a coherent injector in a sense, but how important is the scattering in here? You have again a ton of electrons in there. Are these electrons decohering fast enough or interacting fast enough that they really mess up your uh, beautiful miniband? Because without scattering, the miniband looks really nice, right? But with scattering, you really raise the background a lot. And that is what we were able to, to examine to a certain degree. And then we don't know exactly yet what the scattering rates are. We haven't done any real detailed calculations. But what we do know is that scattering is important and that the IVs are going to be affected. And you have to do a couple of adjustments to structure to possibly get good FETs out of that. So that's still ongoing work, by no means done. But again, contacts are important. All right. So now I'm going to switch gears completely to sort of optical devices. And what I want to highlight is some quantum dot work that is also sort of ancient, but it puts some validity on some of the models uh, that we use. So uh, I'm sure you have seen quantum dots. Here's a quantum dot molecule. These are the red are the uh, indium atoms. In green are the um, uh, gallium atoms. And uh, in blue were the arsenic, uh, arsenic atoms. So here you kind of see there's a wetting layer. And then there's confining uh, indium atoms that are typically the du uh, double dot. The second one is larger. 
And you can really see that this is a pretty complex structure in terms of number of atoms and their strain fields that align these dots on top of each other, etc. So um, how do these things gr are grown, right? I'm better not talk too much about growth here, right? Art Gossard is here, but here's a sort of a comic on how I think about it. So you take indium arsenide and grow it on top of gallium arsenide. It doesn't quite fit. It has to stretch. And if you grow too much of it, it tries to clump up. And that's how you roughly get quantum dots. And then you cap it with some gallium arsenide, and you kind of intuitively feel, well, there's going to be a lot of strain on these dots. Now, of course, this is a Mickey Mouse representation of, of the real thing. The real thing might actually have uh, about 15 million atoms in the strain domain, the quantum dot electronic structure domain where the electrons feel the wave function is about 9 million atoms, and the quantum dots itself maybe only 100,000 atoms. So it's pretty big, but the strain is a hugely, immensely distributed thing that goes, even for a quantum dot of 5, 6 nanometer high, it goes 30 nanometers down. So it, it, it really feels what's going on underneath or distorts what's, what's underneath. So now, in a, again, in my comic type look at it, if you have an alloy cap, you can put in additional indium atoms here in this cap, and those ultimately will squeeze the quantum dot a little bit. They interact with each other, and the strain fields interact. So indeed, what happens is if you have a capping layer, you can squeeze the quantum dots slightly from the lateral directions, and they will expand a little bit in the vertical. Now, this is typically 20 nanometers, and this is 5, right? So a small change in the small dimension can have a dramatic effect on the confinement in this quantum dot. So that's a critical thing to know. So this is actually old stuff. Um, maybe in 2005, six, one of my students walks into my office and said, look, I found this beautiful experimental data set. What people have done is they've grown many structures, and they varied the indium concentration in this capping layer and tuned the emission wavelength towards 1,500 nanometers, which is sort of a, the magical number for optical fiber communication. Right? You want to get those to emit at 1,500. Um, and he said, look, I ran this in Nemo, some large structure. I used our normal published parameters. And the ex what, this is what I get. I completely overlap experiment. And he said, let's publish, right? I want to publish right away. I'm like, this is fine, right? You stuck it in the computer, and the result came out, but why? And then eight months later, we eventually figured out why, right? Things like uh, squeezing makes a lot of difference. We have small analytical models that put us in the right ballpark, that you have bimodal indium, gal uh, indium arsenide, gallium arsenide bonds. I mean, a lot of details that are in the code, but you wouldn't know it until you really analyze it and understand it. So just because it comes out of the computer, it may not be right. So, um, so it took a while, but really it gave me a great comfort to, under to see that we can overlap experiments in a, in a, like a, what is it, 9 million atom electronic structure calculation. That's pretty, pretty amazing that that comes out, okay? And it makes sense. All right, and no parameters changed for it again. So now uh, I had some other students that said, well, these strain calculations are very expensive. We're going to make some analytical models. That is coming out in, in a week or two now. That's relatively new. And now on NanoHub, we have the quantum dot lab where you can put in different geometries. You can calculate the wave functions and the strain, and people do that. And we have some, I think, 5,000 users on that tool by now, which is a kind of a cool thing for people to explore quantum dots. All right, so I've done some electronic structure calculations of optical relevance. Now I'm going to go completely on a limb. Gallium nitride is very new to me, right? Never worked on it really until three, four years ago, and I'm still learning a lot. But we came up something in collaboration with Philips, Lumileds that I think allows us to calculate extended structures. So here is one of their prototypical devices. You have a um, N, N over this side, P over this side. There's a blocking area that prevents the dark current. And you kind of sketch in the eigenstates, right? And you have uh, 
states like what I indicated earlier that are confined, maybe you have excited states as well, and then the holes make life really uh, much harder. Now most tools that I know start from a representation like that and then begin to calculate some absorption rates or some scattering rates or some uh, scattering in rates based on some drift diffusion model. This is as far as quantum mechanics goes with most of these tools. Maybe the optical absorption is based on some basis representation. But transport-wise, that's as far as it goes, I think. Now, so you emit and you uh, emit light. And then you ask yourself, well, how do these electrons make it through, right? How do they make it through a staggered uh, a ladder state? And how do these holes make it through these humongously large barriers that are very heavy barriers, so to speak? And um, what you have to keep in mind is really that these discrete states, if, you, if they were really discrete, they don't carry current. So they are broadened. And how is the lead affecting the broadening? And how do interactions in the leads or in the quantum dot broaden the states? And do you have coherent or incoherent flow, right? So there's a, a lot of questions that come in that are usually patched in to a tool set. So one way to look at that from a quantum mechanical way is really looking at a density of states, which is where the electrons could be, right? So lots of lines means or dense lines means uh, lots of electrons. So you can kind of see there is indeed the states here that are showed. Um, but they're distributed, they're broadened, they're not uh, infinitely thin. And uh, the leads over here are also not just a bandage, but they're really uh, distributed as well. There's reflections in there, and of course in holes, all hell breaks loose anyways. So really what you should do is take away these bandages. They're meaningless in a heterostructure like that. Right? They're really distributed states in a quantum system like this. So there's really no local bandage, so to speak. And you kind of make out, well, here's my source, here's my drain. And, but these are the quantum mechanical states we're really dealing with. They're distributed and they're connected. And um, really, you should n discard also these discrete states that I drew in there, because they're really not discrete. So now the question is, how do we calculate transport through such a system? Um, here, I'm showing you sort of one of the final results where I'm actually putting in the electron density as well. So there's very large uh, charge densities in the center wells, right? But you still I haven't told you how we get these electrons there, right? But the intuition tells you, similar to what I showed before, there's huge charge densities here in the emitter, huge charge densities here in the collector. There's lots of scattering there. I can calculate until the cows come home to calculate that scattering, or I can stick it in and assume thermalization. And we're doing the same thing again uh, in this structure in the middle too. So this structure is large, 120 nanometer. You have huge charge densities inside. There's lots of scattering in the well, and there's no good electron-electron interaction self-energy sigma, if you speak green functions. So what we do is, um, we partition again the device, and I want to point out this is not a perturbation, but it's exact within the Hamiltonian you choose. So there's no approximation to the quantum states. And just for visualization, just so it's easier for me to partition, I'm going to add back the local bandage so you kind of see where I'm going to cut. Um, so that's where I start. And what we do is we, similar as before, we put the reservoir on the left and the right because there's lots of electrons and lots of holes. But we're also introducing local equilibrium onto these various wells, because there's lots of electrons in there, lots of charge. All right. Um, and really, the assumption we have made is that we assume a local equilibrium, that there will be some Fermi level, which we have to compute, but that there is somewhat of a Fermi level in there. All right, so we assume equilibrium and strong scattering, and the injector or the source is also the receiver and the drain of current. And the rest in between here is normal quantum transport. So let me focus in on this device, forget about the scales. I'm going to home in on the electrons now. So here's again this quantum well structure, 
six quantum walls, one, two, three, four, five, six. They're not perfectly aligned, they're already under bias. And I'm going to start to divide the structure along these lines. So again, the pink regions are in equilibrium, and anything between is out of equilibrium. So you can see I can tunnel from, say, this pink into this pink here through this barrier. I can tunnel from this well into this well through this barrier, and so on and so on. Okay? So what I really do is I do rate equations that help me tunnel from one reservoir to the next. But the tunneling rates and at what energy I'm tunneling, I'm getting from detailed quantum mechanical calculations. So really, it's a simple rate equation model for each of the wells. But what I want to emphasize is here that it's a very sophisticated injection mechanism. If I'm injecting into this particular quantum well, it sees the whole heterostructure that's out here. It's not just an approximation of what is out here. It sees the whole finite heterostructure. And it ejects or sees this heterostructure. If I focus on the next well, again, it sees the whole heterostructure. So if there were a mini band that is well connected like this, it sees it. It's there. I'm not approximating that. And again, on the last one as well. So it's, I really want to emphasize that while I use rate equations for the occupancy here, I'm using quantum mechanics really to inject carriers all the way across as needed. And that's the way. So now I obviously do this for all the quantum wells, so six in this case. And I presume you will believe me, I can do this also for holes. So I connect them to the holes that are underneath, right? And I can calculate uh, optical emissions and uh, radiative and non-radiative uh, recombination, uh, recombination. And um, I'm putting it all back together for you where now I can calculate a structure where I can look at the current that is coming out for each of these quantum wells. And uh, this is sort of an experimental confirmation of what the industrial people knew, that really one of the quantum wells on the P side was emitting much, much stronger than the other ones. Okay? So that is in alignment with experiment. And also the IV we get out is in alignment with experiment. We have to put in a serious resistance, but we get the voltage right uh, in terms of turn on. Their simulator they have built in-house for quite a while did not do the uh, IV curve right, and the turn on right. Okay? That's my understanding. So, so really, we're hopefully uh, helping uh, as we um, migrate forward with this device. And really, what's on the on the horizon is extended devices, proper hole and electron tunneling. We have that. Strong scattering in the quantum wells. We match experiments. But an IV is, you know, it's, it's a cumulative effect. What we want to do in the future is really optimize devices and improve optical and scattering models. So we don't just assume thermal equilibrium what we calculated out of equilibrium. But now we can do that in a small domain for each quantum well which is much bigger than trying to calculate transport, including scattering for the whole structure, which we couldn't afford to do. So that being said, um, I, I covered a lot of ground. I want to highlight some of the items that are under the hood in NEMO now. Um, fundamentally, we represent the material with tight binding, empirical tight binding, that is either matched to experimental data in terms of band gap, masses, et cetera, when available. Or we uh, map to some ab initio calculations to any sort of degree of sophistication that we can trust. And then we cut something, right? We cut out all the core electrons, because the art is in the cutting, because the computers are finite. So we uh, usually just deal with the valence electrons and uh, map them into realistic structures and then calculate physical properties one can measure. Um, what's under the hood is um, we can do uh, uh, calculations of atom positions of up to 50 million atoms. We can calculate valence electrons up to 10 million electrons, and then we can do electron-electron interactions for a few states. Concrete for the strain, we use something of valence for force field method. Some people know this as a Keating model. Or very trivially speaking, it's balls on a spring with very sophisticated springs. It's classical springs connected to each other with maybe
second, third nearest interactions, but it's still classical. Um, on the quantum mechanical side for the valence electrons, we usually use an SP3D5S star model with spin orbit coupling. So uh, it's really a 20 band or 20 orbital model. We can include piezoelectric effect and polarization charge densities into the uh, distributed field in a mean field way. And when we have um, electron interactions like uh, mean field Poisson, maybe with LDA, or if we do really truly electron electron interactions, we calculate Slater determinants, depending on what is needed for the physics we're looking at. When I went to grad school, so that's quite a while ago, people talked about devices getting smaller. It was clear the large devices were being modeled with drift diffusion. People were still modeling or developing models for Boltzmann transport, but it wasn't clear what formalism to use at uh, quantum scale. And superior data was certainly the, on the forefront on, on introducing that to engineering, but he also made it very clear that while you have a law of equilibrium and a Hamiltonian, maybe you perturb it a little bit, us electrical engineers have a much bigger problem. We have contacts. We actually have this whole thing out of equilibrium. We take electrons out of one reservoir, put it in the device, and pull it, pull it out at the other end. That is highly in non-equilibrium. Most physicists really deal with uh, equilibrium problems, and we are really in non-equilibrium. And the good thing is with this negative theory being established, you can really derive Boltzmann, you can re-derive drift diffusion out of it. You have a unified model that can really deal with any kind of device that has a source and a drain, some gate, and you just choose the Hamiltonian that's in between. And the Hamiltonian describes the details of the material, of the geometry, but the methodology on how to think about transport is unique and uh, unified. So at TI, we really built the first NEGF uh, tool, dealt with really RTDs in this form. Uh, then at JPL, we started doing these quantum dot calculations. No transport, because we couldn't afford it. Uh, but we can go to large uh, geometries. Uh, then I had two students that parallelized this code, or actually started from scratch and built a new code that can scale to large CPUs. Then Mathieu Loisier uh, brought in uh, Omen and con continued to develop it at Purdue. Omen is Nemo backwards, and now we uh, really combine all these codes in what we call Nemo 5, that really has transport at any uh, um, crystal orientation and materials that we can think of in a normal single electron way and it parallelizes quite well. And then really this was the first predictive or industrial strength NEGF code. This is the first electronic structure code that can handle 10 million atoms um, and this uh, won a Gordon Bell Prize nomination for running at the PETA scale and this one I'm trying to commercialize to a certain degree to get more stable funding. Um, the real exciting thing about the generation of these codes is that the first four were sort of built by very special or very crazy people, depending on your point of view, but typically in a one, two, three man effort or person effort. Now NEMO 5 is uh, built by professionals and some 20 students that all can interact with various modules in the code. So it's really become more scalable to maintain something that's much bigger than just a, a simple MATLAB type code. And obviously, I don't do this myself, so there's a sort of representative picture of the group. And um, it's really funded out of a variety of things from foundational work in, in quantum computing and scientific work all the way to what's the next switch or petascale computing then uh, I'll talk a little bit about nanohub service and then industrial development and industrial use of this code. So it really covers the gambit of, of a variety of customers, so to speak. Um, I didn't talk about silicon germanium, silicon interfaces or interface roughness. We're starting to worry about transport in metals and semiconductor interfaces. Of course, we also have to work on these TMDs. Here's a, oh, let me go back. This to me is an amazing figure. 
we can run this Omen code and also know NEMO 5 on a, one of the largest supercomputers we have access to in the US on 220,000 cores. It scales virtually perfectly. To put that in perspective, you run for one hour on that system that corresponds to 25 years on a single CPU. That's how heavy computing lifting we can do with some of these codes. And that got the uh, Gordon Bell Prize uh, honorable mention. Unfortunately, at that time, in 2011, the Japanese had the bigger computer. So they won, but at least we had the first engineering code. And then I mentioned the single impurity tunneling, et cetera. But what's really exciting to me is uh, one aspect that I could have never done at uh, JPL, which is deploy these kind of tools on NanoHub. So we built interfaces. So nine tools are powered by NEMO uh, codes. They served over 22,000 users who ran over 400,000 simulations all over the world. And what's even more amazing is they get picked up in 381 classes with some 3,700 students all over the world in classes. I could have never touched those classes. And the analytics of NanoHub show me now that these codes are affecting people's learning in the classroom. And then small companies like these use it too. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, give you the overview of what I talked about. One thing I want to highlight, the NanoHub tools are going to be listed in the Web of Science as of this month as a proper publication. And I've said this for many years when I go out and say the tools are just as important as the papers. These are the new publications. A tool that actually can help somebody compute something is just as important as the final result of a paper that nobody can reproduce. So pretty excited about that. And I ran a little long. I'm sorry. Thank you. Questions. Now, it's being recorded, so if you're going to ask a question, you have to take the microphone. OK, questions? OK, um, I had uh, a question. So when you showed the picture of uh, a broadening of states in an LED mm -hmm. under the GAN LED slides, yep. what was the broadening due to? Was it due to the contacts, or was it thermal broadening? Um, so what we do is. Um, when we assume a local equilibrium here in this quantum well, um, we impose a optical potential that broadens the state. And we associate that with the high electron density that is there. So it's really due to electron, electron, and phonon scattering in the well. Uh, if we left it out, still the states would have some finite broadening, but it would be much smaller because this barrier is quite thick and of course, this barrier is almost infinite. And on the flip side here for the holes, these states here would almost be uh, infinitely sharp, sharp because they really don't see coherently the contact. In fact, anything below this edge here would have a delta function of an eigenvalue. OK, so uh, it's electron, electron scattering, and electron phonon well, scattering. We, again, we stick it in by assumption of thermal equilibrium and broaden the states according to that. Uh, one other question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, so when when we talked about non-interacting contacts, I'm I'm pretty sure you've tried this, but um, uh, how did it compare to a picture where you had two contacts, a very large non-interacting contact and a smaller but still large interacting contact? I'm not quite sure. Are you talking about three contact device? No, two contacts in series. One is uh, uh, one is non-interacting and it's gigantic, and you don't calculate anything. So you're looking at phonon, uh, electron drag effects or things like that, or no, just trying to verify if in including uh, interactions in the lead is uh, important or not by just splitting it into two parts. No, we haven't really done that. What I had done is uh, in the past. Let's imagine you have a source and a drain, and this was a double barrier structure. Um, what I had done is, um, uh, people ask me, how, do, how well do you know if this Fermi level is flat? How well know? And I did a drift diffusion calculation self-consistently with the whole structure. And if the current is very high and the doping is very low, then the Fermi level drops a little bit. But in all the relevant devices, 
these contacts are quasi-metallic. So I'm not sure I completely address your question, but inside here, these high doping regions, it's perfectly fine at the room temperature device to assume they're non-interacting. Okay, next question. So you showed a few of the FET structures, and I'm just curious how you, you treat the oxide or dielectric interfaces, especially after you showed the quantum dot structures where you have strain induced by um, right. impurity atoms. So very carefully. <laughs> no, it's, um, uh, it, dep it depends on the geometry. Say when you do a nanowire, say silicon nanowire, we know that the wave function penetrates into the surrounding oxide. The question now is how do you treat the surrounding oxide? Most of the time we do it actually like a homogeneous fake material that has the right dielectric constant and the right band gap. But now we're getting into the realm of calculating it better with a, something called extended Huckel um, basis that is more chemistry based so we can do amorphous materials better. So. It depends on what we're after. We can include it, but effectively you make your wire thicker. And then therefore your domain of the interesting wire gets smaller and people are in general not necessarily wanting to wait longer. So it depends on how you ask the question. So if you really are worried about the interface effects, if you have interface roughness, you have to have an oxide around it because otherwise you just have elastic effects. So it depends on what question you ask and uh, what you're interested in. We can treat the surrounding material explicitly through atoms or through a fake material also, through sort of fakish atoms, or we can leave it out, assuming a hard wall, right? Those are typical ways of looking at it. And again, it, it, there's no a priori answer on what needs to be done. So Gerhard, how do you um, how do you handle traps? I don't. So if you <laughs> so uh, so if you had to, you'd have to do it in a parallel code, which basically. Um, I mean, I. Uh, so I, we we started thinking about it, right? And there's few people that have dealt with it in the sort of a transport way, right? If you want to do it in a real way, you would have to have a three-dimensional representation, right? And you, s you would say, I'm going to hold an electron there in that trap. It's going to modify mo my potential landscape. And I'm going to shoot other electrons across, or maybe I calculate interactions through phonons, etc. So that can be done. But I have not l yet learned on how to do this, say, in for any of the three phi's where you have really a, a, a defect like a, a void, right? How do you parameterize a void in tight binding, right? How do you parameterize a, a missing atom given that you have some dangling bonds? I mean, we know when we have dangling bonds, states will be there. In fact, we found surface states when I didn't know yet how to passivate a surface because my quantum dot at some point is finite. If I don't do anything on the surface, I know I have dangling bonds and I have surface states that, I, that come out of the code for free. I, I don't want them, right, because they're artificial. So that by the same token, if I take an atom out, I will have dangling bonds. I have to learn how to do that for defects. So, so I would have to talk to then to Chris, who has a model for defects, and he taught me some things on that the charging matters. It's, the way I think about it is like a quantum dot, right? There's an electron in there or not, and it has a different excitation spectrum whether or not the electron is in there or not. So, so those are things to learn, but I have not done these calculations. Okay. No questions? So um, I have perhaps like a very basic question, but uh, I guess my question was how you select the parameters for your model. It seems like if you're dealing with fields, um, primitivity is perhaps a basic parameter and it's typically defined only for bulk materials mm -hmm. or uh, and so it seems like the way you're doing it it'll be very ge geometry dependent and I want to know will your model or the, your simulation results be very ge geometry dependent or 
Are you simulating one type of device? Or you know, in general, if you're trying to write a simulator, you want to be flexible enough to change the parameters. Such as you mentioned that you're going to change the geometry to match um, you know, the, the result. But that will be dependent on the parameters you choose, such as the primitivity. Right. So, yes, if, if I go back, um, remember I had this panel of four by four, uh, two by two uh, RTDs, right? Um, what went into the Poisson is a dielectric constant. It's the DC based dielectric constant of the bulk material. So we did not recompute the dielectric constant of that geometry. Um, and the result was okay. Um, we did not modify any material properties for these uh, different RTDs. I think it was like a, maybe around 100 different geometries that were built. We, we just locked the material parameters in, in, and then simulated this, just the geometries. We didn't have to change it. So that's sort of a desired outcome, right? Where you don't modify your material properties and you just say, I'm modifying my design parameters, which is the geometry. Now in 3D, it's a little bit more complicated. And I spent probably four or five years of my career running genetic algorithms trying to fit these darn tight binding parameters to something that is physically meaningful and experimentally measured. And so that was real pain. And once I can impose pain on students, I said, I'd like to have a, a mapping method that would take a DFT calculation, looks at the wave functions, and sees if I can get wave functions and tight binding parameters out. And that work has come to fruition to a certain degree that's published now. So, but on the dielectric function, I have not calculated those things at all. We just always went by the, by the bulk value. But the local electronic structure basis sets, we don't mess with it. We lock it, we keep it, and then we do our device calculation. Is there room for improvement? Probably. <laughs> right? For the nanophotonics guys, it would be very critical to model a dielectric function locally. Right? I get that. But we haven't done that. One more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you also do f uh, phonon transportation with this method too? Can we do phonon transport? transportation? Transportation. Yeah. Yeah. So when I showed this sort of flowchart, right? Uh -huh. You give me a Hamiltonian, I do transport for you. That's exactly what's happening. Uh, okay. We now have phonon transport. We look at thermal flow across interfaces in silicon, silicon germanium. Mm -hmm. The next channel challenge is to couple those two, right? To, mm -hmm. to have a phonon bath that evolves uh, and transports energy and have an electron uh, bath as well, have them interact with each other, heat each other up or cool each other. So that's what's going on. But the methodology, whether you do use a fermion or a boson, there's no difference. Is that, um, so when you showed the comparison between the scattering and ballistic methods, uh, the, what? the the results from the scattering method and the ballistic method from yeah. TCAT. So you show some energy level, you show some energy difference, like uh, 10 milli evolves or 5 milli evolves. Was that on the gallium nitride device? I think so. Or the RTD? I think that's RTD part, I think. The super lattice FET part, I think. Oh, the super lattice FET. Yeah. Yeah, I think. That yeah. guy? Yeah. Uh, maybe next slide. This guy? Maybe next one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, may I know what that energy means? For oh, this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, that's the optical potential or the scattering rate we stick into that reservoir, which is basically f six millielectron volt corresponds to 0 0.1 picosecond scattering time. So, which is okay, okay. for okay. high density electron gases. Okay. Uh, it could be calculated more accurately, but we just haven't done it. This is this is pretty new for us to be able to do that in 3D and 2D. So that scattering includes all the, it is a comprehensive scattering. It has everything in it. It has everything in the kitchen sink okay. in it 
plus the assumption of it's so strong that it's thermal equilibrium. Okay. So rather than trying to compute how we get to thermal equilibrium, uh -huh. which is extremely expensive, yeah. for the regions where we know we must be very close, we assume that and use that to speed up our calculation. Okay, but that al that's also something like impurity, depends yeah, on anything, impurity concentration right? anything or something. Anything that helps you randomize your carrier okay. distribution. Okay. And gets you down to thermal equilibrium. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Right, okay. Probably we should wrap up. And if you have further questions, just come up front. So let's yeah. thank the speaker. Thank you.